By the end of 1986, Poltergeist 1 and 2 were both successful at the box office. MGM execs didn't care about the curse of Poltergeist, just the bottom line. Poltergeist 3 was about to materialize. The studio brass had no idea what they were in for. MGM executives approached producers Mark Victor and Michael Grace about Poltergeist 3. Both of our heads hit our desks. The thought of going uh, back into Poltergeist land again that quickly was uh, something that we weren't able to do. So studio execs turned to Gary Sherman, a veteran writer and director best known for the film Wanted Dead or Alive. MGM approached me about coming into write, produce, and direct Poltergeist 3. You know, the, the, the rumors and, 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 and legends about the curse of Poltergeist that really didn't bother me a lot. Sherman focused on the cast, not the curse. The first cast member they wanted, uh, made the offer to return, was Heather O'Rourke. As far as the other cast members, they said, you know, there could be a cost factor involved, but if we get Heather, we know we can come up with a movie. Heather signed on, but the rest of her on-screen family passed. Desperate to secure at least one more original cast member, Sherman hunted Zelda Rubenstein down at a Los Angeles movie premiere. He said, I'm Gary Sherman. It'll be my pleasure to direct you in Poltergeist 3. I didn't even know there was going to be a Poltergeist 3. And he was so utterly charming. I just, you know, I said, I'm yours. The director then cast Tom Skerritt as Carol Ann's uncle and Nancy Allen as her aunt. There was a rumor, there, it was really kind of creepy in a way, there was something about that people had died, there are certain people associated with the movies, I remember hearing something about that and I didn't think about it too much. 18-year-old <laughs> newcomer Lara Flynn Boyle won the role of Carol Ann's cousin Donna. But Sherman didn't just change the main characters of Poltergeist 3, he also moved the action from the suburbs to the city. A lot of times they'll, you'll take horror films and, and, and thrillers and people will move them into isolated places because they feel they can build fear with isolation. I think it's more frightening to know that something is going on on the other side of a wall and that nobody cares. Chicago's landmark skyscraper, the John Hancock Tower, became Carol Ann's new home. Heather O'Rourke was eager to start the movie, but her family was concerned about her health. Manager Mike Meyer. She'd been sick for two years. And when they went to Chicago for Poltergeist 3, they were in fact dealing with stomach specialists. And they had gone through a series of possible diagnoses. And for each step in the diagnosis, there had been a different remedy that was suggested. They determined that she had Crohn's disease from the symptoms of throwing up so they put her in a cortisone. In the spring of 1987, Heather O'Rourke arrived on the set of Poltergeist 3. Heather O'Rourke um, started production on Poltergeist 3. There was a sadness where the other cast members uh, were not returning, but yet this was a job and uh, she went forward with it. Heather O'Rourke loved to act. We're back. The set was unlike anything the actors had ever seen before. Gary Sherman planned to do all of his special effects live, using a complicated system of mirrors, body doubles, and duplicate rooms. Every set that was built with a mirror in it, the set was duplicated in reverse through the mirror. Everyone had a double, and the doubles would be doing exactly what the principal characters were doing. The intricate shots were difficult to pull off. The actors and the crew were constantly struggling to get it right. A lot of times there'd be mirrors to wherever we were, and then there'd be the doubles, the, the body doubles. So, and you'd all, you'd, all these moves were choreographed. So it was just, it was a very eerie kind of thing. Soon enough, cameraman George Kohut noticed a disturbing coincidence. The 666 thing is strange because our, at that time our union local number was 666. So I was sort of used to that. Yeah, during production, Gary lived at 666 North Lakeshore Drive. And then the strange accidents began again. Early in production, stuntman Corey Eubanks was testing an underwater catapult 
designed to launch actors out of a swimming pool and into the air. Stunt coordinator Ben Scott. You press the button and the thing didn't go off, so he's starting to float, your body starts to float. And he tries to swim out of the way and the thing went off. And bam, hit him right in the shins. Sliced his shins up. It was, it was a pretty bad deal. The engineer at the John Hancock building who was assigned to help us on the show was sitting in the lobby one night when we were shooting and sitting very still and ended up that he had passed away. I feel very guilty about Gary breaking his leg because in fact I fell into Gary and drove his foot under the dolly and that's how his leg got broken. Things only got weirder for Sherman and company. While shooting publicity photos before one of her scenes, Zelda Rubinstein was overcome by a strange premonition. She said, like a bolt of lightning went through me. I just felt like really strange for a second. I said, you know, you want to work? And she said, oh, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. So we start setting up to do the scene. And uh, Barry Bernardi, the producer, comes down out of the production office and pulls me aside on the set and says, we have a problem. We're going to have to lose Zelda because we just got a call that her mother just passed away. I've always had an unusual connection with my mother. And when I was called out of, from the set to go to the business office, I knew that my mother had died. Proof sheets come back from the gallery shoot. And we're looking through them. In the middle of all of this, there's one photograph that has light everywhere. And it's all out of focus, and it's all weird, and, and it's like multiple images. And we're trying to figure out what this is, and we're all looking at it and saying, boom. Anyhow, uh, it, it looked like a light leak in the camera or something. We had the negative analyzed and everything. Nobody could ever figure out what it was. It just was like this cosmic thing that happened. Obviously, this was the moment that Delta's mother had passed away. Coming up, the set becomes a living hell. That smoke's pretty bad, and it's starting you know, burn your throat and your nose and your eyes. The production of Poltergeist 3 was plagued by accidents and strange occurrences. But the cast and crew didn't give up. Still, no one was prepared for the real-life disaster about to take place. On set, director Gary Sherman continued to push Tom Skerritt and Nancy Allen. Every time they'd say, you know, okay, it's time for you to go to the set, and it was like going to my execution. It was so horrible. Running, being chased by cars, screaming, crying, you know. <laughs> it was just very effective, but it wasn't fun to shoot. Sherman even asked his cast and crew to stand on a window washing rig suspended from the top of the John Hancock building. Tom Skerritt found the idea terrifying. He says, unless you are within two feet of me at any given time, I'm not going. Because if you're not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. I said, you're not really, you're not going to put us out there, are you? You're not really going to put us out, you know, whatever it was, a hundred stories up in the sky. Stuntman Ben Scott was worried too. He knew that the building had its own deadly legacy. When I met uh, the guy that ran the uh, window washing rig, he said that when they were building the Hancock Tower, a man died for every floor that was put up. I mean, like 109 guys died building that thing. Sherman and his cast and crew got on the rig and prepared themselves for the worst. We first started going out towards that edge and I started hearing it. Yeah, the wind was coming full on like you're standing in front of a huge fan. Everybody, you know, would look at me and go, are you sure this is okay, Ben? This is safe? You've been out here and done this before? And he just said, don't look down, don't look down. <laughs> of course, I had to look down, you know? It's like, you have to. It was just horrible, absolutely horrible. The filmmakers pulled the scene off without a hitch. But they weren't so lucky with the next scene. In the summer of 1987, the crew prepared to shoot the most difficult and dangerous stunt of the movie. We're shooting the uh, frozen garage scene, and when Kane's car explodes, this was going to be a very big explosion in a confined space. 
with lots of combustible materials around. Dangerous was stamped all over it. Every possible safety precaution was taken for the shoot. Everyone was moved out except the four or five special effects guys. We had the firemen all in there with their hoses primed at every exit. Every They were only inches off camera at any point. And the idea was is that once the explosion went and the fireball came, as soon as the fireball hit camera, I would yell a cut. They were supposed to move in with the fire hoses and put out the fire. Simple. It was rehearsed. It was rehearsed again, and it was rehearsed again. Assistant cameraman Peter Kuttner. All safety had been taken care of. We felt safe. We didn't think we were in, in any danger. So here we go. We're doing it. I yell, action. The explosion goes off. And it is beautiful. And that fireball just comes rolling right towards the cameras, absolutely obscures everything. And I yell, cut. All the doors that led down into the garage open, and who comes running out? The firemen. The explosion scared the hell out of them, and they just dropped their hoses and ran. Stuntman Ben Scott was inside the parking garage and witnessed the explosion firsthand. That cloud was full of fire and smoke, and it was black and ominous and big and scary. I mean, my first reaction was, duck, here it comes, get underneath it. And I saw the firefighters' legs over there, and the cars burning over there and the hose sitting in between them that was charged and ready to put out the fire, but nobody to uh, man the hose. Scott followed the firefighters out of the garage. I mean, the fire department was there. They were just standing there watching it burn. And the, the mayor is standing there and he says, just let it burn, just let it burn. It'll go out, it'll go out. It's all concrete down there. Sherman realized that a maintenance worker was still in the parking garage. The director yelled at the firefighters to help but the men didn't move. Then Scott did. My wheels started spinning and my adrenaline was pumping, so I ran back the way I'd come out and went down and, and find the, uh, the maintenance man. He goes, what happened? What's going on? I said, come with me, come on, let's go. And the smoke's pretty bad and it's starting, you know, burn your throat and your nose and your eyes. So I took off my T-shirt and wrapped it around my face and he had a jacket he wrapped around his face. Scott rescued the maintenance worker. Then he went back for the cameras took both cameras upstairs and handed them to the camera guy said here and that's when Gary Sherman thought I was a hero for saving the camera and the film Ben Scott was really a hero that night the fire burned out and I think it was like a million and a quarter dollars worth of damage or something but the, the best part of the story was the next morning cast and crew gathered to complete the film well we still had quite a bit to shoot when Heather passed away our immediate gut reaction was to not finish the film. Um, but unfortunately, or whatever, uh, money rules, and um, there had been a lot of money spent, and basically we were told by the financial powers that be that either we finished the film or somebody else finished it. So um, I had to write a whole new ending for the picture. Sherman used a double to replace Heather and shot his new ending in one day. The effect that it had on the film, um, which I guess is almost irrelevant compared to the tragedy of her dying, but uh, um, the film ended up to be a totally different film than we had originally planned to make. On June 10th, 1988, Poltergeist 3 premiered. Gary Sherman was glad the experience was over. One of my favorite things to do is go up and sit in the front row of the theater and watch the audience, but I don't think I did that with Poltergeist 3. I don't think I wanted to sit through a screening of that with an audience. Gary Sherman wasn't the only one who stayed away from the theater. Critics viciously attacked the film, and Poltergeist 3 was a box office flop. The news was out. The Poltergeist series was considered dead. But was it? Coming up... People want to have this mystery, this little extra fear in their lives. Nineteen eighty eight wasn't a good year for Poltergeist fans. Heather O'Rourke passed away, and the series' latest installment, Poltergeist Three, was a big disappointment. Miraculously, Poltergeist came back from the dead for one more round. In September 1996, 
Poltergeist was resurrected for the small screen. The television series Poltergeist The Legacy aired on the cable network Showtime. Director Gary Sherman was hired to write and direct, but he didn't stick around for long. I think the series had an opportunity to be something that it didn't become. And I, I, I signed on to try and help move it in the direction that I thought would make it better. But um, my ideas and other people's ideas were not the same. Poltergeist The Legacy lasted four seasons. There may never be another reincarnation of Poltergeist, but the film made a lasting impact on fans and cast members. I get approached all the time by people that have seen it, and it's made an impression on them, which is one thing that you realize the impact that something like that has had. We had no idea it would be the phenomenon that it was. We thought it might be one of those movies that went right to drive-ins, you know. You just, we had no way of knowing. As for the curse of Poltergeist, there are those who believe it isn't over yet. In 1994, the Northridge, California earthquake rocked the quiet suburban street where the original film was shot. The only home that sustained any major damage was the Poltergeist house. You need a scorecard to tally the catastrophes, accidents, and deaths that haunted the Poltergeist series. The debate rages on, curse, or coincidence. As far as the curse of Poltergeist is concerned, I think that it just means that here are a series of uncanny coincidences and synchronicities and accidents that seem so unusual and so out of place that we can't really work out how to fit them into our um, sense of reasoning. I think that a movie can just feel wrong. Bullsh People want to have this mystery, this little extra fear in their lives. Listen, life is so scary these days. You don't need things like mysteries on the set of Poltergeist to add to it. I think when you're making a film, even when you're writing a film, uh, there's a certain kind of thought and energy that's put out. And that has power, has some kind of power. When you decide to create fiction, you need to take care Aware, about where it might drag your thinking and where it might drag your reality.